All right, I'm going to make a start. It's 3.30 for me. And welcome back. Hope you are all watered and in comfort um, in this hot day. So this is our session on emerging technologies uh, stream. And it's my pleasure to be introducing the Durham session. <laughs> so we had first we had Paul Finley, uh, representing also Matthew Wood, who's not here today, to talk about providing guidance and support to academic staff about the challenges and opportunities of generative AIs and LLMs. And as a side note, as a chair's prerogative, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit that um, in Southampton, where I am from, my name is Adriana Y, by the way, I'm going backwards. That was one question that we put to our uh, lecturers, prospective lecturers, and it's very interesting, the variety of perspectives there are, the fears and the excitement that is all across the sector and is represented in, in our new lectures. So I, I'm, for one, very excited to hear what Paul has to tell us. So for, without further ado, Paul. Okay. Thank you. So hello, I'm Paul Finley. I offer the apologies to my colleague, Matt Wood, who can't be with us today. But today I'm going to take you through this talk about what we did at Durham when AI suddenly appeared on the scene last November and how we've tried to offer support and guidance to academic staff and some of the lessons that we've learned um, over the past um, nine months or so. So I work in a department called DCAD, which stands for the Durham Centre for Academic Development. And I sit across two teams, one on digital learning, where I offer pedagogic advice to academic staff, and another in um, academic development, where I run workshops for academics, whether they be teaching or research. So when AI appeared, it was right up my street. Um, and I think it was launched on the 30th of November last year. And I first became aware of it uh, as a big deal on the first day back after the Christmas holidays when Matt put a video up on YouTube explaining what ChatGPT was. And this was on a Teams channel, and that Teams channel exploded as people were going to start to go through it, going, Oh, this is interesting. Look what I've done. Look what I've done. And really, straight away, I think a lot of us saw this as a challenge and an opportunity. And various people in my department did different things. So we put up some initial guidance on, on internet pages. Our senior leaders started to work with the university exec to craft a position. Uh, and Matt and I suggested that we run initially a workshop, just explaining to people what AI is, what it could mean, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities. And I've got to say, we ran our first workshop in March and we've run it eight times since. So quite a lot actually for one single subject. And as an educator, it has been a unique experience. And a bit of background about me. Um, before I worked for the university, I was a teacher in the state sector for 10 years. I've been a, a lecturer, I'm currently a digital digital learning advisor. I have a lot of experience of standing at the front of a classroom at a lecture theater. I once calculated I've done somewhere between 8,000 and 9,000 hours at the front. So when I say it's a unique experience, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating the fact it really was unique. I think fundamentally what that comes down to is I've never dealt with a subject that is changing so fast. This is the only workshop where I've ever had to put a disclaimer at the very beginning going, what I tell you today is true. It most definitely will not be true in a year's time. Uh, and that was really a bit of a challenge because quite often I stand at the front of the room and I know the answer or I know how to work out the answer. Wasn't always the case here. But anyway, back to my timeline. Um, Durham adopted an institutional um, position of embrace, educate, and enhance, being, meaning we're going to embrace AI, educate our staff and students about it, and enhance our practice. And as soon as that position paper went out, departments started to contact us going, what's this all about? Can we have a bit of support and guidance? So uh, another colleague, a learning designer by called Candice and uh, Nolan Grant, started to offer department-specific workshops. That was a bit of a mix of the introduction workshop, but also very much focused on assessment. And about the same time in June, I ran a few pilots 
doing very specific workshops on how you can use AI for teaching and learning and using AI for research. I mean, altogether, since about March, we've delivered over 30 different workshops focusing on various aspects of AI, which compared to most other subjects is a huge amount. We wouldn't normally deliver on one particular topic that much in such a short time period. And we've learned quite a lot from that approach. And here are some of the lessons that we've learned. So the first lesson I think we learned was to keep it simple, especially when it came to the technical de detail. Because when we initially did this workshop, we were like, okay, we have to explain how AI works. And my colleague, Max, stood at the front and he started to go into what neural nets are and machine learning and all that. And you've got to remember, this is a room of academics from across all disciplines. And their eyes started to glaze over a little bit. We, we didn't need to go into that much detail. So we tried something else. We tried to explain it as a input-output machine. And that didn't really work as well. It was just a bit too simplistic. We then tried to explain it as a bowl spaghetti, which that kind of got away from us as well. What we eventually settled on was we just got our phone out, put it on the overhead projector going, predictive text. You've seen this in action. You've used it. You understand the basis of it. And through that medium, we could explain how these AIs work. And that was quite a nice example for people to quickly grasp what they needed and then move on to the stuff that they really cared about, which was how it's going to impact on them in their teaching and assessment. And when it came to their teaching and assessment, the key thing that we had and we learned from this is we had to have our hook prepared. And with this, what I mean is there are so many interesting and wonderful things that you can do with an AI. In fact, there's too many. If I wanted to do a workshop with all the various things that we could do, it would be a very long workshop. So we had to target the things that we selected and shared with our colleagues. And some things appeal to different segments. And this is where we were very selective in the things that we shared across the different workshops. So some things that got instant buy-in interest were, you know, essay plans, giving it a piece of writing, say rewriting it to match a given style. Um, one that they, some colleagues loved, especially when they have a large cohort, was instant feedback. So giving your students at the end of the lecture an open document going, right, what are the three things that you want to work on next? And then getting AI to analyze, analyze that. Colleagues who have a large cohort and feel like they never get to know their students love that idea because it gave them some instant feedback from those large cohorts. Developing your own tests, creating chatbots. So one thing I did just as a, a trial was to create a little chatbot um, that was basically just had a model handbook put in it and it took care of all the basic um, questions that you might get about the admin and colleagues quite like that idea. Again, literature reviews and data analysis, all things that you can do quite easily and appeal to researchers and can be quite effective. Uh, and initially, when we did this, we, we thought about how to deliver this. And it would quite often would be me or Matt standing at the front of the room doing a, a demo, which it's OK, but it's not particularly engaging. So generally, when we selected one of these hooks, we tried to deliver it in one of three ways. First way was play. So we would do a demo, very short one, and then just ask people to play, to have a go with it and see what happens. And that was really important because quite often when colleagues came in there, into that room, they have heard of AI, they've read about it in the BBC News or The Guardian, um, but they haven't actually tried it much and they didn't have any idea about its capabilities. So I remember one colleague when, you know, we did a bit on translation, I'd, I, one, one lecturer in classics going, I'm fine, doesn't do Latin. And I asked him, are you sure about that? He's like, I'll try it. And to his surprise, yep, it does do Latin. Uh, and he was like, oh, okay, the, now, okay, this now affects me. I can, see, I can see the point. So giving people the opportunity to play was really important and quite a good way of doing that. The next bit was debate. When we just threw up a question on the board going, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? How will this affect you? And people were in mixed groups with people from different faculties and they talked and debated it. And those were really engaging. You could see that walking around the rooms, people having really quite intense debates about this. And that was a really good way of getting buy-in by people to discuss this. The final way 
was adapt. So we would do an example and then tell people to adapt it for their subject, their discipline. And that way, quite a few people across some quite nice things that they've now tried out in their practice. The final thing that I sometimes struggle with was materials. So initially, Matt and I took um, materials from our own discipline. So Matt was, is a psychologist. I have a background in education. Um, and that was okay. It wasn't brilliant because generally we were talking about things that people didn't have a, a great expertise in. So trying to find some materials where people had some common understanding was initially a, a struggle until we hit upon a few different ideas. One, we took a lot of material from our PG CAP course, where a lot of our academics have to complete that if they want to get their fellowship of the HEA. So they had that common knowledge and could comment on it and understand what we were doing. The other module that I found that was quite useful at Durham was we have something that's called scholarship in higher education that is aimed at first year undergrads. And it's, telling, it's talking about how to write for an academic audience, how to do things like arguing construction, a thing that an academic does all the time when writing articles. But people, people across all disciplines have a background in that and understand it and could see how that was used. So it's quite useful for that. So altogether, we would put these three things together and we created quite a nice delivery method for the different aspects that we wanted to talk about. And that's what we did in the kind of introduction of the ChatGPT opportunities and challenges. But after that, we started going to the more department specific workshops. And in those, we wanted to talk about assessments. And we wanted to have that start a discussion with our departments. Because at Durham, the departments have complete freedom of how they approach this. It's not driven centrally. Departments are responsible for making up their AI policy. So every department wanted to have a bit of background with this before deciding what they're going to do. So we went into there and what we were aiming to do was to present all the various options that they have and to discuss them in depth so they have a good grasp. Now, let's be honest, we have an agenda when arguing this, okay? I don't wanna say we wanna guide people to the good decisions, but we wanna we want guide them away from the bad decisions. So we were quite, we tried to you know, cover every single base going, right, first option is you could ignore it. Can't recommend that, it's risky, it's out there, students are using it. So next, prohibit. And again, we look at this in a short term and medium term going, well, prohibit, there's no real way to enforce this in the short term. We don't have any AI detection tools that work. In the medium term, yes, you may have heard of Turnitin. Is anyone from Turnitin in the room? <laughs> uh, what we've been saying is we have grave doubts about whether detection tools will ever work to a satisfactory degree and make our colleagues aware of that. The next option, invigilate. Now at Durham, that very much means sitting in a hall, sitting in a room somewhere and doing an exam with invigilators walking around. But depending on your own co context, that could be proctoring. And again, we've said, we kind of said that, well, that, that could work, could, could be appropriate that's for you to decide. Next, we'll go to, well, you could try to design around it. So um, know what AIs can and can't do. So one aspect that we picked on was it's not particularly good at reflective accounts because it doesn't have access to your own personal history. Now, obviously, if you feed in enough prompts for your personal history, you can probably get something out. But at that point, haven't you done the task already? But for that, you have to understand how the technology develops and also where the gaps close. So an example of this I had just on Fridays, I had a colleague send an urgent message going, can you please talk to me now? It's like, okay, what's the problem? And she was like, I attended your workshop over the summer. I thought it was great. And I, what I wanted to do was an activity where I put an essay topic in and then my students and I will discuss how the answer is and how it's not very good. Uh, she was like, I tried this in June. That, that seemed fine. It was quite a few weaknesses. And last week she was preparing for the new term and she did the exact same thing. And the essay that came back, she was like, it's too oh. good. I can't do this in front of my students. It's with no obvious weaknesses. It's like, yeah, that gap's closed. AIs are improving all the time. And that's going to be a challenge if you're going to try and design around it. Because if you try to plan for January, going, I'm going to do this, 
and you get to January and that's something that gap's closed, yeah, that's going to be a problem. The next one was to encourage the use of AI in your teaching practice, in your assessments. Now, in the short term, our two principal concerns are equity and privacy. The fact that you can pay extra to get ChatGPT4, is it fair that some students will have access to a better AI than others? Well, no, it's not fair. It's blatantly not fair. So that's a problem. Privacy, we don't know what these companies are doing with your data all the time. That, so that is a little bit of a worry. In the medium term, what we were saying to our colleagues were, was you know, along the lines of, at some point, there will be institutional licenses for this kind of thing. Our best guess is that Microsoft will release something at some point where it's integrated into Office where we'll have to use it. But that'll be coming down, at, coming down the road. So be aware of that and just be aware that you'll have to be at the top of the kind of innovation curve if you want to use it. And the final option, which is the biggest one, was actually maybe we need to free think what we're doing completely and not just be welded to this idea that assessment is something that takes place at the end of a course via a, an exam, whether that be open book or closed book. And short term, you, you can't really do that because it takes a long time to, to think about it. And in the medium term, there's going to be workload implications about that because you're not you're doing a complete redesign, redesign of what you currently do. So you need to be aware of that and be aware that it could come. So in this slide, we very much went through the kind of practice of it and went, okay, this is where we are. But for next, we had to marry that with the practical. So at Durham, we had to say, well, these are all lovely ideas, but what does that mean practicality? And in our case, it means changing our module outlines, which are done on a very long time scale and have to be very carefully worded. Um, so we're giving our colleagues an idea of what it involves and also giving a little bit of advice because what we didn't want them to do was to write a very detailed um, description because if these things change, it's not, if AI changes, it's very hard to change these things in our institution. And that will vary for different ones. So we also married the practical with the, the theory to say what you needed to do. After all these workshops, we asked for feedback. That's our standard practice. But because we've done such a large block of these, we want to get a bit more detailed feedback. So at the end of the academic year, we sent a survey to every single person who had attended any type of AI workshops, asking for their feedback. Um, and what we found is, yeah, they liked the general overview. They found that was helpful. They enjoyed the debate and the discussion. That was good. When it came to aspects that could be improved, they were like, there's no grand theme. There's nothing, one, no big, one big thing, which was kind of disappointing because that would be a really easy thing to fix. I would have loved that. But it was, like, very, it was very department specific. And when asked about the next steps, they were going, okay, we have to do something departments, assessments. And I'll be honest, when I saw this set of results, I was like, mm, yeah, I, I could have guessed that was what people were going to say. Um, it wasn't that interesting to me because it didn't tell me that much that I didn't know. But thankfully, we did ask a few more questions. And what I found fa fascinating is when we asked them about how confident they were with different aspects of AI. And I was quite shocked by the results because I've never seen such a um, set of results where the orange is the unconfident and, where's my key? Oh, there it is, yeah, it's in the middle. Um, orange is not confident at all. I've never seen that from an academic audience. Usually academic audience are quite, you know, confident in the thing, but we saw across the board there how uncertain people are about using AIs, even after attacking, attending AI workshops. So to me, this tells me there's a lot of work to do. We can see that when it comes to using AI tools in research, there's a few here, but yeah, mainly incompetent. Designing student assessments, yep. Um, identifying AI-generated content in students' assessments. Rightly, I think people are uncomfortable in that and know that they can't do that reliably. Um, marking assessments that are using AI, again, people aren't sure about how to do that. So we're starting to see what our priorities are for the coming years. Um, one thing we never actually touched on a lot was actually using AI tools to mark assessments. And that's going to be, I think, a topic that's going to come up a bit more and more as the year goes on. 
Um, and again, as you can see here, learning, using for learning tools and content. The one thing where we actually start to see a bit of confidence is where people are starting to think, oh yeah, this is going to have an effect on learning, teaching outcomes. And I need to think about that. So I thought that was quite an interesting set of responses from that area. And from that set of responses, we start to see some of the areas that we're going to be working on. So over the next year, our plan is to work on a few different areas. One, student guidance, because we haven't done a lot on student guidance at all. We haven't explained to students what they can and can't do or what they can or what the possibilities for them. We're going to run a recurring set of free AI workshops, one on learning and teaching, one on research, and a final one on prompt engineering to try to upskill our staff in those areas. And finally, we've been offering grants to different academics to try out new approaches in their disciplines and gather evidence over the next year. So when it comes to next summer, we can review that and try to see what works and what doesn't and then plan ahead on that. So with that done, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'll come to you. Thank you very much. I was wondering, uh, very interested in the fact you said you'd, you'd enable them to do a bit of a play session yep. um, at the beginning. Did you, how did you navigate the kind of, well, what tools should we use? Because I think a number of institutions, I know this is something we're wrestling yeah. with. I mean, we've got some advice to give, but we're kind of having to caveat it all in terms of, well, we don't really know what to suggest. We're certainly not going to, but you know, because we know what the privacy concerns are. We don't yeah. want to kind of engender this trap. You know what I'm saying? Though. Yeah, ab absolutely. There were a lot of caveats. So, so the one thing I would say is any rule of thumb, anything you put in there, assume you've lose control of it. So just don't put anything any sensitive or data that you don't want published. When it came to individual tools at the beginning, it was quite easy. It was ChatGPT. But now before that, I recommended our ChatGPT, um, Microsoft Bing, which is pretty much the same, Claude 2 and Google Bard. And the one I found easiest for get staff, more staff set up on is Bard because everyone has a Gmail account. But it is caveat timely going, yeah, there is some concerns here about what's going in and what's going out. Any other questions? So I will take, oh, oh, oh. I'll, I'll give the mic to you. <laughs> Sorry. Just as somebody who's uh, got some responsibility in creating guidance for students from, from where I'm from, um, have you encountered any resistance or, or concerns about providing guidance to students from your staff? Um, yes, uh, just anecdotally, there is concern because the, the debate we have is do we want to teach this because the worry for staff is they'll use, students will use this to cheat. But our policy is that students are going to be upskilled on this and embrace it. So it, it, it's trying to, you know, go at the same rate as staff are developing their courses as well. But we haven't got, a, I think, a definitive answer about how the best way to do that is. And it's still an ongoing debate. I had a question down there as well. I missed that. Sorry, who's asking? Oh, okay. It was similar, so. Okay. Any other questions? You guys are making me run across everywhere. Brilliant, thank you. With the concern about, you know, obviously students using it for nefarious reasons, but on the flip side, the point that you mentioned about, okay, but how about embracing it to help with the learning? Is there any concern that students will get wind of that and then start to go, well, hang on, what am I paying for if you're going yeah. to start marking my materials? I mean, you could then say, well, oh, you're trying to cheat to do your assignments. But I was wondering, how do you see that being navigated? Well, that, that argument came up quite often. And where it always seems to go to is, I think we Talking about well, what do you want out of university? What are you, why are you here? What is the point of an education if you can just do it all by AI? So what are you getting out of it? And I, were, I was very much advocating to people and they would bring that up going, well, you, we need to talk to students about why they've come to a university and what they want to get out of it. And that's something we don't actually do that often. We just, they just come here, sit in the room, we lecture them. We never have that discussion about why they're sitting there and what they want to get out of this experience. 
And I would personally advocate you need to have that conversation and say, it's about the skills you develop by doing this work. And that's what you're getting out of it, not just the degree classification at the end. It's the hard skills that we will use in the world of work later. Another question here. Yeah. Thank you. It's just a follow-up comment because we're we're planning to unleash our student sessions and our staff guidance in parallel. And that's exactly that's the consistent message. I think that the golden thread between the two is to get students to understand that they're important employability skills, but don't become over reliant on it because you're paying for this premium product, which is developing your criticality skills. So just yeah. just as like we can't stop them from using the essay mills if they really want to. They are ultimately just selling themselves short by doing so, I think. I want to take the last question as a prerogative. Um, one of the things that we have been discussing in Southampton is how this can be an opportunity for students of whose, whose English skills are not great. And also for us who have to read their, you know, their, their, their products, you know, their, their way of thinking. So it actually can be something empowering mm. in terms of if, if used well, if the assessment is well designed, they produce something readable that actually represents their real thoughts and their real. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to hear from your perspective is that if that, what elements of assessment design we need to take into account for, for uh, LLMs in particular, being empowering rather than something that's used to cheat. Yeah, so when we did the teaching session, we went through the different scenarios in which a student to use this. And there were the entire scenario where they just get it to write the entire essay, but then there was a scenario where they get it to rewrite the style of the essay to improve the communication and communicate their core idea. Um, I thought that was very powerful because uh, when, people, when you present that to people, they're like, actually, I can see the point of that. It just it helps improve it, and that's a, a valid use of it. Uh, but I think it's having that discussion with people and saying, have you thought about that? Are you happy with it? Uh, and I think the vast majority of people we've had that discussion with, they are happy with that approach and can see the use of AI in that context. Thank you very much.